Alrighty, well, welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne and I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And it is my pleasure to welcome back Patricia Donahue, um, who last month gave us a fantastic talk about a former slave, Benjamin James, and the history of the house that she lives in, the Mount Eli Hancock House. So again, welcome, Patricia. We're glad to have you back. Um, Patricia holds a BS degree from Columbia and an MS degree from Rutgers both in the sciences. Um, after 15 years in government and corporate positions in environmental protection, she became a public school science teacher. Um, recently retired after 22 years in the classroom, she had earned her master gardener certificate. So congratulations on that, Pat. And again, thank you for uh, willing to speak with us today. Um, before we get started, a few housekeeping items to go over. Uh, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of the program today, but you can submit them at any time using the questions box or my email address, which is on the screen. There is a survey that will be prompted at the end of this program, as well as in a follow-up email. If you can please complete that, we would greatly appreciate your feedback. Um, if you're looking for more Master Gardener tips, um, you can check out the Monmouth County Master Gardeners webpage at the link on the screen here, and I will make sure to send that out in the chat so that everybody gets that. Um, one last thing before we start is a tutorial of the GoToWebinar dashboard, for those of you who might not be familiar. Um, if you are using a PC or a Mac computer, this is what your dashboard should look like. If you're using an Apple or Android mobile device, uh, the app is going to look different depending on what device you're using, um, but all of the features will still be there. At any point, if you're having any problems or can't figure anything out, you can use this raise hand button here. That'll alert me that you're having some type of issue and I will message you and hopefully we'll be able to figure that out. Um, if you're having audio issues here, um, make sure that you're connected via your computer audio and that your speaker option here is the correct speakers that you're trying to use, whether it's the internal speakers on your computer or if you're using a headset. Um, there are no handouts for today, but below that you should see your questions box. And this is where you can type in your questions, hit send, and that will get sent to us. And again, we'd be happy to, to answer them at the end of the program today. That is all that I have for you. So it is my pleasure to turn it over to Patricia. Okay. So give me just a second to make sure that we have this working properly. Andrew, you will tell me which screen do you see? Um, we see the presentation, so it looks like you're good to okay, go. Okay, so it looks good. Now I have to, I'm going to get rid of myself here and I'm going to, if I remember correctly, I can shrink this down and get it out of my way. All right, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, as Andrew said, I got my master gardening certificate just a couple of years ago. And um, although I live in Mercer County, uh, Mercer didn't have a program that year. So I got mine from Middlesex County. Each county uh, should have um, its own master gardener group. I will be giving you the link to uh, the one that I belong to, which of course is the best. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to be talking about raised beds, containers, and straw bale gardening. And let's start with what's a raised bed. What does that mean? So um, in a raised bed, you're growing plants in soil that is higher than the surface of the ground. Um, commonly, it's done in an enclosure, but it doesn't have to be. Um, it's more convenient. Um, and you can grow vegetables or display flowers. And this is a good alternative in places where you don't have a uh, good soil, good space, uh, not enough drainage, which is the problem here on my property. It happens to be um, quite wet, uh, or if you personally have physical limitations. And typically raised beds are divided into two categories and we call those formal and informal. Now, the main difference is that formal tend to be enclosed somehow with a type of material and informal uh, tend to be more mounded areas in the ground. Now, I believe that you can make an informal bed look formal 
uh, by manage, carefully managing the edges. And this is what I've done on my property uh, so that there's a nice clean line between where the bed is and where the lawn starts. And it makes it, <clears throat> excuse me, look more formal uh, without needing to build any kind of a structure. So there are a lot of advantages uh, to doing uh, raised beds. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I'm getting over, I just started on uh, antibiotics for a sinus infection, so please excuse my voice. The um, advantages include that you can garden almost anywhere. Uh, if you have poor contaminated soil, you can overcome that issue. Uh, you can grow a wide array of plants. Um, there, this type of gardening is uh, a bit easier on your body. Uh, it can be dog proof. Uh, of course, I'm sure many of us have dogs that would just as easily jump into this bed uh, as not. Uh, but um, if your dog tends to just stay on level surface, then hopefully you could keep him out. And there's better air circulation. And you'll notice that this is a picture of a small formal bed. So here's another formal bed. Uh, this one is not quite as fancy. It's made uh, basically of plywood. Um, but again, it shows you there are more advantages. Uh, you have better control over your soil quality. Uh, the soil is better drained. It can be warmer, which is important because that allows you to extend your growing season. Uh, they're easier to get to. Uh, usually in a formal bed like this, you would have some type of surround that makes it easier to walk up to it and work in it. You can grow more in less space. Uh, it's much easier to monitor if you've gotten some sort of pest or disease into, in your plants. Um, and there's a lot less bending. And because you're usually creating your own soil, at least you should be, and we'll talk about that later, you can actually match the soil to the plants that you want to grow. I'm not going to get into that level of detail of you know, what pH or type of soil you want to use if you're growing such and such. Um, that's beyond the scope of this. But in raised beds, it allows you to really make that match so that you get the best growth possible. So before you get started uh, with a raised bed, there are a couple of decisions you have to make. And one of the first ones is, where are you going to put it? So what you need to consider um, is how much sun is there. Depending on what you want to grow, you may only be able to choose a site that has full sun. You need access to water. One of the differences between growing in the ground and growing in a raised bed or a container is that you are going to have to add more water. So you don't want to place your raised bed somewhere where you can't reach it uh, with a long hose, for example, because uh, you certainly don't want to be hauling water um, all the way out to it. Uh, you want to consider what animals might be in the area. Uh, some people will put um, uh, dividers down into the ground to keep animals from digging in and up into their bed. Uh, you might want to have fencing to keep deer out. What was the site previously used for? Uh, certainly if there was dumping there, some sort, you want to uh, maybe take that into account and put a barrier between your raised bed and the soil. Uh, how many people are you going to have involved and not too terribly important, but something you should look at is, is the site level. Uh, pick the flattest spot that you can. So you've located it, and now may, you need to consider what materials are you going to use to build it. And you have lots and lots of choices. <clears throat> so if you, uh, whatever material you use, it should be rot resistant or untreated material. <clears throat> if you are, say, replacing boards on your deck, you want to pick a wood material that has a preservative in it. You do not want to do this if you are using the wood for a raised bed garden. Uh, some of the treatments or preservatives that have been put in the wood are not going to be beneficial to your soil, to the creatures that live in the soil, to your plants, or to you. Um, there are some approved materials. Um, but for example, this one, um, the ACO, is um, arsenic free, but high in copper. So copper can be a, an outside, 
Uh, so you have to be careful how much copper you're, you are willing to introduce or going to introduce into your bed. Uh, plastic wood has become uh, very fashionable. It was in one of the first pictures I just showed you. Uh, it's typically made of recycled material, which makes you feel good about using it. It doesn't break down. However, it is very expensive. I've looked into it for uh, making some repairs on our porch and um, it's quite pricey. So um, I thought, let's just keep it really simple. What's the simplest way that you could put together a raised bed? And here's something I found. Um, this was Home and Garden, I think. So it's about $50. That may be more now because the price of wood has really skyrocketed, but you really only need four planks, uh, 12 pieces of rebar, a mallet, some newspaper or cardboard, and some soil. Basically, you put the planks together and use the um, uh, rebar and the rubber mallet uh, to make them stay in place, lined with newspaper, and then fill it with soil. It's really quite simple. Um, depending on the kind of wood you use, it may not last all that long because the wood itself really at some point is going to decompose. Okay. Other things to take into consideration when you're picking your site and building your raised bed um, are how many, specifically how many hours of sunlight does it get? Uh, because if you are trying to grow vegetables, you're going to need at least eight hours of direct light. Um, other plants will do okay with six. And you have to have a correct orientation. Um, if you plant, if you put your raised bed east to west, then some plants are going to shade the others behind them at different parts of the day. So you're better off putting it in a north-south orientation so that they don't create shade um, against one another. Okay. Another thing to consider um, is the depth. So the minimum is six inches, uh, but 10 to 14 is typically what is recommended. Uh, the deeper your bed is, the less watering you're going to have to do. Uh, more shallow raised beds and containers require more water. Typically, you want it to be uh, three feet by six to eight feet. Um, it's a matter of the price of the wood uh, and the amount of space that you have. And it's advisable if you're doing more than one raised bed uh, to leave two to three feet between them. It's just easier to work around the bed if you have some more space. Now, when I first put this presentation together, uh, I was supposed to do it in person at a senior center, and they were looking to start a program for their seniors. And so one of the topics that I included was this idea of having a wheelchair access or access for the disabled. And then I decided for this presentation that I was just going to leave that information in there. Um, I think it's valid. And even if you were to set up a bed now, uh, you don't know that 10, 15 years down the road um, that you would want to have uh, some uh, disabled access to it. So these beds have shown you um, some of the, the basically wood materials, uh, but you don't have to go and get actual wood planks. You could use logs, for example. Uh, if you've had a recent storm and some trees have come down on your property, you can cut them to the approximate lengths that you want and roll them like this and set up a raised bed. Um, railroad ties are also popular, but again, you have to be careful because these may be treated with uh, preservatives that you don't want in your um, getting into your soil and your plants. Some other popular materials. Uh, are uh, bricks. I have one brick uh, raised bed. I didn't build it and it was here when we purchased the house uh, and um, a little more shallow than this one, but it has the advantage of having raised the growing space up above a very wet part of the house, um, near a few feet away from where we have a sump pump. 
So in that instance, uh, I'd be hard pressed to grow many things there because the soil stays wet almost all the time. So the raised bed uh, has made a difference in that location. Now this looks like you had a professional mason do it. Uh, so does this. Uh, this is out of uh, field stone and um, block, very pretty. This can be a pricey uh, to purchase all the stones. And you, unless you know how to do this, you are much better off having a professional uh, align the stones and mortar them, et cetera. You can also make a raised bed out of steel. Now this is uh, rusted. Um, so you have to like that look. I personally think this is quite attractive. And then there's aluminum. Every time I go to Tractor Supply, I see these containers and I'm so tempted. I really, really want one. Uh, and this might be the year that I actually do it. Uh, they're, um, the container itself is lightweight. Keep in mind that once you fill it, it will no longer be lightweight. You will not be able to move it. Uh, so you have to set it where you want it. But they are uh, deep enough and large enough uh, to handle a very sizable garden. And I personally think that they're attractive. I'm sure it's not to everyone's taste, uh, but I like it. Now, a, um, another easy do-it-yourself way is to use cinder blocks. So you have to pick the size and the shape and the pattern. How are you going to lay them out? Uh, first, you have to remove whatever is going is underneath them. So you'll see that the weeds, et cetera, the sod have been scraped up. The blocks have been put in this case over some of that weed mat material and have been filled in with soil. And you'll notice that they've put uh, some sort of uh, slabs uh, to cover the holes in the uh, cement blocks. Uh, but you don't have to do that. As you see from these examples, you can actually use the holes to grow plants. Now, where I used to live, we had a row of decorative cinder blocks, the kinds that are typically used in construction, uh, so that when you look at them face on, they have an attractive pattern of some sort. But these have been laid out in the ground and they had the holes on top of them. And um, my Mother's Day gift every year was several flats of impatience. And I would be out there and in every single hole, uh, I would put an impatient. And when they all grew in, it looked absolutely lovely. Um, but it, it was quite a bit of work. Uh, you can see in the picture on the right that there's been a combination of cinder blocks and uh, some other um, more fancy material than just your plain blocks um, and at different adjusted at different heights and uh, in a nice staggered pattern and uh, this can actually be uh, quite lovely uh, even if you are using cinder blocks. Um, I just put this one in here because I thought it was so funny. So this person not only built themselves a lounge chair um, surrounded by plants they even put plants in sideways when they had the holes facing in the other direction. Um, it doesn't look particularly comfortable to me, but it certainly is a conversation item. So if you're growing plants, depending on what you want to grow, some of them uh, need some support. So you should consider in your raised bed whether or not you need to add a trellis. Now in this picture, the trellises are actually quite large. Uh, I suspect that they're probably going to be growing uh, cucumbers uh, or some sort of um, zucchinis or something that is going to climb all the way up this and need all of that space. The other item that you might consider adding, and this may be important at certain times of the year, would be some sort of protection uh, for your raised bed. I know in um, the park where we did our master gardening work that we used um, curves of PVC and then we put a white tarp um, over it and we tied it all together with uh, bungee cords. And the primary purpose there was to keep certain uh, beetles from getting into some of the plants that they found particularly attractive. Uh, the 
problem with adding protection uh, de depends on whether or not you actually need insects to get inside. Uh, certain plants are not going to produce flowers or fruit or vegetables for you unless insects can get in there uh, to pollinate. And you have to watch them uh, carefully. If this is just made out of a screen, that's fine because there's airflow and rainwater can get in. Uh, but if it is a, a glass or a plastic or a tighter weave material, uh, you have to take great care because it can get too hot in there. Uh, you may have to add additional water. So suppose you want to do both. You want to have both a trellis and protection. Uh, here is a rather sophisticated setup uh, that to me looks almost like it's also a greenhouse. They could have used this to start their seedlings in the first place um, before moving them into the ground. Uh, the cover rolls up. This is actually a, a very, very nice setup. Uh, I have not attempted anything like this, uh, but it looks like it has been made out of materials that are pretty much readily available at Home Depot. Now, if you want to purchase a ready-made setup, you could get something like this, or like this. or even like this. Now, I suppose you could have this made, um, but I, um, what's interesting about this one is that the surround at the top uh, has a shelf built into it so that you can put down uh, your tools, your buckets, whatever you're working with, and still be able to lean over. And as I mentioned before, uh, accessibility uh, was important to me. And I think that everyone should have an opportunity to garden. So here are a couple of more examples. Um, you'll notice that the two to three foot spacing between uh, the raised beds has been increased uh, to allow for uh, wheelchair access and crutches. And if you notice the knobs that are on each corner, uh, those are handholds uh, to help folks hold on uh, if they're trying to stand or lean uh, up against the raised bed. Um, you'll see that the water spigots have been taken right out to the raised bed. Uh, so the one closest to the foreground and the one farthest away uh, both have water spigots. So you don't have to go very far um, to get water for the bed. Now, if you are concerned about animals gaining access, you can do something like this uh, that has a fence uh, screened fence built in, and it also includes a door. Uh, this is also wheelchair accessible. It's been made wide enough that someone can uh, wheel themselves inside and still be able, they're not, the, the beds themselves aren't so wide that you can't reach across um, to the plants in the back. Now, I, I can't resist these containers from Tractor Supply. Um, here are a couple of ways that accessibility has been designed into it. You'll see uh, the picture on the left that the ground has been replaced with some crushed stone uh, to make wheeling across it much easier. And in the photograph on the right, you'll see that the containers themselves have been placed up on uh, boards and blocks uh, to make them a little bit wider. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if you see the uh, person in the uh, red slacks, um, I got one of those uh, for Christmas. I can't wait to try it out. It's one of these, uh, on one side, it's a chair. And then if you flip it over on the other side, it's padded so that you can kneel on it. And then you have the handles to help yourself um, up and down. Uh, I have bad knees and a bad back. And um, all that leaning over and trying to get into um, the garden uh, is, has become difficult for me. So I'm really looking forward to trying out my little garden bench. Uh, there are some that are on wheels. I've given you a couple of pictures here. Uh, the one with the green top has a little storage container inside. The blue one 
has a little tray underneath. And then there are some really nice tools that I've come across um, where they have a, a different handle so that they can, um, they're easier to hold or that they can be strapped onto uh, someone's arm, much like the crutches that come up the forearm uh, to allow uh, folks with limited uh, arm mobility to also garden. And um, then I didn't think of this, I wish I had, because I think this is really clever. On the left, you'll notice that someone has uh, planted plants in these large uh, buckets and has tied a pole of some sort, I think that they're probably bamboo, uh, from each one and tied them together at the top. Well, this is a before, I couldn't find an after, but I did find this after. And what you end up creating, it's like a little arbor. And you can uh, work from the inside uh, and be in the shade. And when this really gets going and you look up, here would be your vegetables um, coming down toward you. And this also, um, not only is it very attractive, um, but it also makes it much easier to uh, harvest uh, your, your vegetables uh, and to keep an eye on them. Uh, it's very easy to see in this setup if something's been eating at them, um, if they've caught a disease, or quite frankly, just to be able to tell that they're ready to pick. So those are some ideas. Now, one of the most important things you can do once you've decided uh, where to put your bed, what you're going to um, use to build it, and what you want to grow, uh, you have to consider the soil that you're going to put in it. So one of the first things you need to know, I'm not sure this is going to work, so somebody please yell at me if it doesn't. So whatever structure you're trying to fill, you need to know how much soil to put in it. And in this particular, let's see if this works, I don't think you can see this. You can't see it because it's on the wrong screen. All right, so never mind that. We'll go back over here. Ah, sorry, folks. Okay, we back okay? I hope so. Yep, looks good. It looks good? Okay. So, um, and I actually tried it before today to make sure that soil calculator worked, but um, not in presentation mode. So the soil calculator, and I'm sure you can find one online, you put in the dimensions of the space that you want to fill, and it tells you how much soil you need to buy. Now, on the surface, that sounds very simple, but uh, I like to make my own soil. And so I will typically combine topsoil, compost, and potting soil. I prefer to use peat moss, perlite, and vermiculite. Um, do not ever take the soil from your yard and throw it into a raised bed. Um, it doesn't work. It doesn't have the right consistency. It doesn't drain properly. Um, now, if you have some existing soil and you're willing to add a lot of compost or, um, to it and adjust it, test the pH, et cetera, you can do that. Um, I find it's just easier to start from scratch and buy all of those ingredients and mix them very well with water and make my own. Um, since watering these containers can be an issue, you might wanna consider uh, doing a trickle irrigation system. You can buy the parts and they just snap together. Um, I have been challenging myself to do this and I haven't yet done it. Uh, part of me wants to because I have a, uh, areas where I have to water constantly. But as I said earlier, my property tends, is low and it tends to be quite damp. Um, so it's almost not worth the effort to do it for a very small area in my case. And um, you should also make sure that you have uh, mulch on the surface because that's going to reduce your water loss and keep you from having to water so much. So here's one of those snap together irrigation systems I was talking about. 
Um, and they're really cool because you can design the shape any way you want. Uh, the hoses are flexible. Uh, there are different connecting pieces. And so you go from wherever your faucet is uh, and the water flows out. You can even set which ones you want on, which ones you want to turn off. Certainly you don't wanna be watering the path between the raised beds. And then I saw this one, I thought this was incredibly clever. Put your downspout right into your raised bed. Now, whoever did this was very smart because the water coming out of that downspout, especially later today, I think we're supposed to get a good soaking rain. Um, it, that water might be coming gushing out and might be forceful. So they've created a trough filled with uh, stones. So the water hits the stones and then trickles through and waters of the plants. So that forceful water isn't hitting the plants or the soil that they're trying to grow in. All right, so what are you going to plant? <clears throat> Actually, when are you going to plant it? Um, some plants like cool weather. So for example, I like to grow lettuce and it does beautifully in the spring. And then as soon as it gets hot, it looks terrible. Now lettuce, fortunately, will give you you can grow it twice in the season. So once the heat is killing it and it's struggling, I can remove those plants and wait until the end of the summer when the temperature cools off and I can plant lettuce again. Um, so you have to take into account that you may not have a particular plant the entire season, whether it's in the ground, in a raised bed, uh, or in a container. Uh, pay attention to your frost dates in New Jersey, the danger of frost. A lot of people say rule of thumb Mother's Day. Uh, that can be too early. The Master Gardener's kind of New Jersey official date is May 15th. Uh, you should not be putting sensitive plants out in the ground uh, or in a raised bed before that. Now, most plants uh, thrive in a moderate soil temperature. Um, some will germinate well and grow well, even when it's quite cool. Uh, others need as much as a 15 or 20 degree difference um, in order to germinate and grow. And some like, sal like lettuce, which I mentioned before, um, will give you two crops. So for example, tomatoes and peppers, you're going to plant them, you're gonna get your crop and you're not gonna plant them again. Um, others, you can plant, harvest, replant, and harvest again. Now, I haven't mentioned this before. Um, it's going to come up again. But one of the things you cannot do in a raised bed, or you, depending on how raised it is, is you cannot plant something that is too tall. So if you have a raised bed and it is only a foot off the ground, you really don't have to worry about this. But if you're using something that might be three feet off the ground, you can't, for example, put a full grown corn plant in it because now your corn plant might be six to eight feet high. And how in the world are you going to reach it? You're going to have to climb up on top of your raised bed. Um, the very tall plants now are also up higher off the ground and are not necessarily as stable uh, if there's a bad storm. So, uh, we're going to move from raised beds to straw bale raised bed garden. I have not tried this. I have seen it done, uh, and I, I may give it a go at some point once I have my own property under control. So you can buy bales of straw. They're very inexpensive. I know that a couple of Halloweens ago, I went and bought some to do a decoration in um, my front porch and they were only really a few dollars each. Um, so they give you some advantages. They um, are warm, so they can extend your growing season. You can plant them on top and on the sides, uh, sort of like those funny cinder blocks that were turned on their side. Because you are not using soil when you garden this way, you're not introducing any diseases. Um, it's very inexpensive. There's a lot less weeding because you haven't brought any other seeds with you. 
Um, they're easier to weed. You can shape them any way you want them, so they're very good for even a small space. And while they hold water well, you do have to water them, very similar to the other kinds of raised beds where you have to be careful that you're giving them enough water. Um, initially, the, the straw bales are lightweight, but after they have plants growing in them and some decomposition has occurred and you've added water, um, at that point, they're not lightweight anymore. They can be dog proof. Um, and one of the attractions to this, and this is why I'm actually considering it, I put out a lot of elephant ear bulbs and elephant ear bulbs cannot sort of overwinter in New Jersey. So at, in the fall, I have to dig them all back up. Um, and this is not easy work. In a straw bale, uh, because they're loose and you can loosen them up even more, it's really easy to get your bulbs back out so that you can bring them you know, in your garage or wherever it is that they're going to stay for the winter uh, without being killed. <clears throat> now, there are some disadvantages to straw bale gardening. Uh, they dry out quickly, so you need to water more often. Uh, because you're starting with just straw, uh, you need to add fertilizer uh, and other uh, soil conditioners, such as compost. The bales don't last but one or two seasons, um, so you're not going to put perennials in them because the perennials are going to come back year after year after year, but your straw bale is only going to be there for one or two. Um, depending on what you've put underneath the straw bale, uh, it entices roots to grow from the ground up into it. So you'll notice that these have been placed to the side of the concrete. Uh, a better location may have been on the concrete. And then every one or two years, uh, you have to get rid of all of this straw. Uh, so you either have to be able to compost it, uh, bag it up, send it to mulching or recycling, um, I have heard of people who have set this all up and then realized that they literally had, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds of this uh, used up straw bale that they had to figure out what to do with. And one of the very first steps, if you're going to try this, is you have got to purchase a quality uh, straw bale. Uh, depending on what you buy, you could get yourself into some trouble, and I have a little story to tell you about that. So uh, folks often will use straw and hay interchangeably. Uh, they're not really interchangeable. Um, if you're going to do straw bale raised bed, uh, you need to get straw from wheat, oats, rye, barley, alfalfa, or vetch. You cannot use corn, linseed, flax, or hay. So many, many years ago, I was involved in a reforestation project as a little, um, in an urban setting and it was a strip alongside a uh, county road and um, it was in bad shape and we decided that we should get a, apply for a grant purchase some trees some shrubs and plant it so um, we we did all of the right things we got our contractor etc cetera, etc cetera. they planted everything and to uh, to keep the soil from eroding uh, until the grass, et cetera, could grow, they put down what we thought was straw. Well, the next year, sure enough, we have hay growing. And at this point, the hay is growing, growing, growing. It's getting taller and taller, and there's nothing we can do about it. The contractor had gotten the wrong stuff, and he had brought in all kinds of seeds from wherever this material came from. And um, basically ruined the project that we were trying to do because now we couldn't get rid of that material and it was taking over um, what we did want to grow there. Now recently in Master Gardeners I uh, received a, an inquiry from a woman who was raising horses and she was buying hay to feed the horses and her hay was delivered with some other plant inside of it and fortunately, she was smart enough um, to decide she'd better know what this other plant was before she fed it to her horses. 
and it turns out that it was a material that had gotten out in a field and had been cultivated with the hay and was actually poisonous to horses. Uh, so she had to send the entire lot back. She had to have the folks come and get it and uh, replace it. So when you're going to buy, if you're going to do this, um, please make sure that you ask specifically for what kind, what kind of um, material that you are getting so that you don't introduce any of these other problems. And, and that, that's rare. I mean, that's usually not the case. Usually you go to a garden center and you get these and you get what you get and it's pretty straightforward. Um, but just because I've heard of some of the horror stories, I thought I would share them with you. So how do you set it up? Well, as I said before, on concrete uh, is good. If you want to put them on soil or grass, you should put some sort of layer in between. Uh, weed fabric, I've used old newspapers um, with a lot of luck uh, in my flower beds um, before mulching. Uh, cardboard works, uh, plastic, burlap, netting, et cetera, all kinds of materials. Um, I recently got a question on the Master Gardener Helpline uh, regarding newspapers and the person who wrote in wanted to know if the ink um, was uh, problematic, should, what materials were in ink that might be toxic or bad for the soil. And that was true years ago, um, but newspaper companies have switched over to biodegradable and soy-based inks, and so that's no longer a concern. You can go ahead and use newspaper. All right, so how do you set up a straw bale garden? Well, you pick a pattern that lets you know how many bales you need, and you put them with the narrow cut side up. Leave the string or the plastic binding um, there because it helps to hold the bale together. And if you are gardening on a slope, you have to go up and down, not across the slope. If you go across the slope, the entire row can fall over. But if you're going up and down, um, with the slope, uh, then there's no reason for your bales to fall over. Now you have to condition the hay bales first. This means that you add water, fertilizer, and you wait two weeks. You stick a thermometer in there, and you should see the temperature go up to 150 Fahrenheit and then begin to drop back. That's a signal that you're getting ready to plant. If you also see parts of the bale uh, turning kind of black and little mushrooms appearing, that is marvelous. We get calls saying, oh, there's mushrooms, it's contaminated. No, that's perfect. It means that your straw bale is beginning the process of uh, providing nutrients and is ready for plants. Okay, as I mentioned before, please don't plant something that is top heavy because you're not going to be able to reach it. And you really want to avoid plants that have runners or that vine, because they will continue spreading through your bale into the next bale, uh, wherever they want to go. So you want plants that are, their root systems are self-contained. And there's a long list here of the kinds of plants that are um, good for growing in, in bales. And there's also some indication of how many per bale. So if you want to do corn, get a dwarf variety, and you can put two in each bale. All the way up to something like uh, lettuce uh, or radishes, where you can plant um, five or more in any one bale. Now you'll notice in this picture, I believe these are tomatoes, uh, and you see the little white sticks? Um, those are all labels. Um, I usually would have said this prior to now, but in any type of gardening you're doing, uh, please add labels. Uh, I know that I had a, a, an experience with my husband where I sent him out to the porch uh, with a pair of scissors uh, to get some herbs I was growing in containers, and um, if they hadn't been labeled, he would not have brought me the right stuff. And as it was, he, he snipped and brought it into the kitchen and things got laid down and then confused. And I ended up having a mixture of these dried herbs and I had no idea what they were. Um, 
it turned out that it was marvelous to use on pork chops. And once it was all used up, since I had no idea what was in it, I couldn't recreate it. So always a good idea, label, label, label. Uh, here's to show you how uh, straw bale gardening, how effective it can be. So both to the left, the right, and in the background, you could see uh, plants, the same plants in a plastic container as opposed to in a straw bale. So the plants in the straw bale have done remarkably well. And if you notice in the top right corner, you see those white bags? Uh, keep them in mind for a second because I'm going to mention them again. And this is the most creative straw bale garden I have ever seen in a shopping cart. Uh, the advantage of this is that if the sun shifts, you simply wheel it over to where the sun is uh, if you have a limited sunny space and you need to do that to move your garden to your sunny spot. So that's it in straw bales. Uh, there are uh, tutorials on specifically how to set them up, uh, what materials to add to them, how much, et cetera, before you, you get planting. But I didn't want to get down into that level of detail for this talk. And I will talk a little bit about containers. So there are advantages to containers. Uh, they're weed free, they're inexpensive. Uh, you can put them where you want them, they're pretty. There are some disadvantages. Uh, they can get very heavy. You need to water them every day and you have to add fertilizer. So the same as with raised beds, you need to consider what you wanna grow and how much sunlight you have. Anything that's going to bear fruit, you need eight to 10 hours. Uh, cool season crops, you can get away with six. You need to have access to water. Uh, they should be kept level. Again, keep your plant tags. Um, the water that drains through, you should never use a container that does not have a drain in the bottom. Uh, the water can pool in the bottom and begin to rot, and then it rots the uh, roots of your plants. So it should have drainage. This means that if you want to put them down on your porch or your patio, you may want to put something under the pot because the material draining out might make a stain. And uh, large containers, and I have many of them, large containers are very, very heavy. And I went ahead and bought um, dollies that are rated for up to two or 300 pounds. Now the containers are not two or 300 pounds, but I figured it was better to uh, over design than under design when trying to move these huge ceramic containers uh, filled with soil. And again, as with raised beds, you had quite a number of choices. Uh, plastic, lightweight and inexpensive. Uh, many of us like the clay look or the ceramic. Uh, those can get quite heavy. I advise against metal uh, because first of all, they have to be lined. And second of all, they can get very hot. Now, aluminum tends not to have that problem. If you've used aluminum, say, cooking pans or cookie sheets, um, yes, they're hot while they're in the oven, but within a minute of being out of the oven, they've completely cooled down and you can touch them. Um, but certainly other metals, you're not going to, um, they're going to stay hot and they um, will cook the roots and your plants will not do well. Uh, I like the picture in the lower left here. That's one of those kiddie pools that you use for children or for your pets. Um, I would have thought it was too shallow, but apparently whoever this belongs to, the plants are doing quite well in there. Now you could go to Home Depot and get everything you need. Um, these are just buckets with some uh, fencing, wire fencing and uh, wooden posts to create a trellis. And then I thought this was adorable. You can get these half um, barrels that are quite popular. And this person decided to cover them with these little plastic umbrellas. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. This increases the temperature inside and stores some of the water but you have to be careful because it could get too warm or too wet. 
And depending on what you're trying to grow, remember you have to let your pollinators get in there. Uh, if a flower cannot get fertilized, then you're not going to get fruit. So one of the problems with containers is that they have to be watered every day. So some ingenious folks have come up with what they call self-watering containers. And I'm not going to go into all of the, the details, um, but the idea is that instead of drainage holes at the bottom, you have an overflow hole, and then that water can get reabsorbed um, through the bottom, or you can take it out and pour it back down over the top. Here's some diagrams of some other ones you can see inside what they look like. So you have your reservoir, your draining holes at the bottom, you have some sort of perforated material or gravel, and then you have your potting soil, uh, your plant and your mulch on the top. Now, if you don't want to uh, go to the expense of buying a self-watering container, you can build one. And this is a simple one with some uh, chunks of uh, black rubber hosing inside a bucket. Um, the, there's a, a old type of colander that is used there and a hole in the side with a small piece of pipe sticking through it. Very easy. Uh, here's a more sophisticated uh, example of how that would work. Um, I have not tried this. There's so much water on my property that I don't typically um, have to worry, although I do have uh, a lot of containers that I've got to water and, and it does get tiresome. All right. The depth of your container is important. You have to match the depth of your container uh, to what you're trying to grow. So if you're growing a small uh, herb, you can get away with a four to six inch container. But if you're trying to grow a tomato plant, uh, you really want something that is quite, quite large. Um, the only exception that I would make to this where it says four to six inches and it says small herbs, if you uh, grow basil, I have discovered that my basil will get as big and the root ball as the container I give it and it quickly becomes root bound and it needs ever bigger and bigger containers. I have enormous containers uh, out on my porch and the basil will actually co virtually completely fill that um, by the end of the season. That would be the exception to that small herb. I guess you really can't consider them small. So what can you grow in a container? Anything. Um, here's a nice uh, uh, list of uh, what you might want to grow, uh, the minimum size of the container, and how many plants uh, you could expect to grow in that container. Now, at the bottom, do you notice how it says Virginia Cooperative Extension? I want to make a point here that whenever you do a Google search and you are trying to find information about a problem in your garden or, or advice on how to do something, whatever search you put in, add the word extension to the end of it. So for example, how to grow green peppers extension. What that does in the search is it will immediately go to these cooperative extensions, just like Rutgers is the cooperative extension. Each state will have these. And then you look for the state that is closest to you. You're certainly not going to take advice in New Jersey from the extension service in Montana or Florida. Um, but you could certainly look at one for Pennsylvania or New York uh, or, or in this case, Virginia. Uh, so be careful of that. Uh, they tend to have the most um, science-based advice, and I would recommend that you use those extension websites um, over just about anything else. Now, there's a company that's come up with a very creative uh, way of doing container gardening. You may recall I had pointed you to some white bags that were in a corner in one picture. Well, here they are again. Uh, these are called grow bags. And this is grow bag gardening and um, makes a couple of points here. One, you see how, how deep the soil is. And in particular, if you want to grow any kind of root vegetables, uh, you need that depth. So I was really surprised when I saw this because I had heard of grow bags before. 
Uh, they're nice, you put them away, you just fold them flat, you can store them in your shed, then you open them up, you put your soil in them, they have handles, you carry them where you want them. Well, this went another step. Uh, it actually has a panel in the side that you can open so that you can get your carrots and your potatoes out. I just thought this was so clever. I have not used them, so I can't comment from one way or another. And again, you have to fill them with soil. So again, don't use garden soil. Um, use a commercial soil less mix. Uh, we recommend ProMix. Uh, if you're not going to make your own, then you should be buying ProMix. And what can you grow in a container? Just about anything. Um, keep an eye out for what are called bush or dwarf varieties, uh, especially for some of the plants that can get uh, very tall or um, climbing. I used a uh, bush string bean uh, last year in a container. And at first I said, well, it's this huge container and it's this little plant. It looked a little bit out of scale, um, but wow, did it produce string beans. I, it was very impressive. And of course, don't forget, you can grow flowers in containers. And here are just a couple of pretty pictures. Uh, containers, as opposed to raised bed or straw bale, have their own unique uh, needs for management. Um, you can mix herbs and annual flowers with your vegetables. Uh, you can do that with just about any of the raised bed ideas. Uh, you can bunch them together uh, to create increase or decrease humidity, but you still have to water. But the one additional problem with containers is that you really should be disinfecting them with a 10% uh, bleach solution every year. Now, I don't do this every year. My containers are really big and hard to handle. Um, I think the key is that if you've noticed that there is a problem with a container, if you've gotten some sort of a disease in that plant, uh, you don't want that repeating itself the next year. So you should um, bleach that container out uh, before you use it again. And then, of course, you could do the uh, cheater's way. I saw this at the Philadelphia Flower Show uh, a few years ago. This is called the Vegipod, and you simply purchase it. And it, it comes all ready. I think there's probably a little bit of assembly required if it comes in a box. Uh, and it does everything. It has all of the features that I've been talking about. It's self-watering. It has a deep enough uh, soil. Um, it has a canopy to cover. It, you can even get them on casters or wheels. Uh, and this looks great, right? Especially if you have a small space and this is going to be your uh, only garden. However, wow, are they expensive. Um, so we were talking at least four figures in a price for these. It was a lot. So I want to just end um, with a few, just a few slides, because one of the problems that we have in urban and suburban life is having uh, small spaces. So how do you garden if you've only got a small space? And the first thing is to consider what you're planting um, if you're doing flowers, fine, but if it's material you want to eat, um, consider what we call edible landscaping. Uh, dwarf varieties, uh, varieties that do well in um, a square foot or less of space. Keep in mind that you need to invite your pollinators uh, and that you should probably plant some herbs in this case or flowers that will specifically attract them to your garden and do that uh, pollinating work for you. Consider using mounds and spirals so that you're not only using the ground level and just one upper level, but that by creating a spiral, you're creating multiple levels uh, in your small space where you can garden. Remember that you have to fertilize in a small space. Uh, the nutrients will get used up much faster and that you should be only adding organic material. You'll also want to rotate your crops. Don't plant the same thing in the same place every single year. 
and you will have to add more organic material every year. Choose varieties that have high yields. Um, so for example, a broccoli plant takes a square foot and that's, you're only gonna get one in that square foot. But there are other plants that will have a much higher yield and you can grow anything that's on a vine because that's going to increase your square footage of space that you have available. Uh, a couple of years ago, I discovered these red noodle beans. They're amazing. They're like a uh, crunchy, nutty string bean, but they can grow um, a foot long and they are in fact red, they're delicious. Remember you can plant everywhere. Any place is an opportunity, a porch, a roof, a deck, a windowsill, a driveway, a mailbox, a fence, any place has potential as long as there's the right amount of sun. You can even grow plants vertically on fences, walls. Uh, you can create these um, lattices, they have a lot of benefits. Um, they're pretty. You can create privacy fences. Um, the only one I do not recommend if you're going to do something like this is do not use a metal container. Uh, I think these were probably done for show. Um, the plants in these containers will not survive. That metal will get so hot uh, that the poor roots will get cooked and um, that will not work. Remember to use uh, dwarf varieties if you can get them. You can even grow fruit trees in a container or in a small space if you get a dwarf variety. When you're doing this, however, uh, you have to get at least two, if not three plants uh, because they'll do better if they can cross pollinate. Particularly important in a small space is what we call companion planting. Uh, there are certain plants that like to be together and certain ones that don't. So for example, tomatoes and cucumbers hate each other, although they taste wonderful together in a salad. And I'm gonna take a minute if I have one um, and tell you a little Native American story. Uh, they had a method of gardening called the Three Sisters and they would always plant corn, beans, and squash together. The combination um, did three things. The corn was a trellis for the beans. The beans are nitrogen fixing in the soil, so they provided nutrients to the corn and the squash. And the squash grew along the ground with these big leaves providing shade so that it kept the weeds from growing and it helped to retain water. So you can create these kinds of combinations yourself and you can look up companion planting once you decide what it is that you would like to grow. Now, if you have a very small space, uh, consider adding a mirror. It makes your space seem larger. And if you're really, really short on space, consider that you can move your container to where the light is. Consider adding storage in your small space. So yes, in the middle there, you have a raised bed, but a shelf has been built underneath it um, for additional storage of your supplies. Consider picking and choosing your containers to add some visual coherence in a small space. And while you cannot do this, maybe you could do one. And we call this square foot gardening, where you have a four by four or even a three by three space, and you grid it out so that each foot has a different plant in it. Or you can get a pallet and put the pallet down, uh, fill it underneath and in between uh, with soil, and then use the rows uh, for growing your plants. And um, while I thought this was a little bit out there, apparently, especially in the cities, this is becoming more popular, is indoor gardening, where you can turn any window into a little garden. Uh, microgreens and sprouts have become very popular. Uh, some folks are setting up uh, little shelves with grow lights. 
And I've even heard of people who are growing under their staircases in their houses. Uh, any area where there are stairs already, you could put more stairs on the side with plants and or with flowers. Uh, so when you're looking around for where to put your garden, try to think a little bit either outside the box or really inside the box, but where is that box? And here's another website for you. This is the uh, Cooperative Extension website for Rutgers. The one that Andrew posted before is the one specific for Monmouth County. Uh, this one is for Rutgers in general. And um, this one will also lead you to the group that I'm with, which is the Middlesex County Master Gardeners. So that is that. And I'm at the end and I'm, well, I am open to questions. So let me just get out of this. And let me see which of these I need to open now. I think I need to go here. And uh, where am I? Okay, I'm assuming you can hear me, but I cannot turn on, how, how do I turn on my video? Your video is on. Oh, now you're it's off. On, but I just can't see it myself. Right. So, you, yeah, you just turned it off. Okay. Oh, I have to turn it back on. There we go. Okay. okay. Very good. All right. Well, we have a, a few questions coming in. So please, if anybody sure. does have questions, uh, please type them in the questions box in the dashboard and hit send and we'll be happy to answer them for you. Um, this goes back to the, the orientation of the beds. Um, somebody sure. wanted some clarification. What does orient east to west or north to south mean? Where does the long side face? Okay. Um, this is important when you're doing a straw bale because you don't want the straw bales to um, either fall over on a hillside. Um, so you need, the direction doesn't matter as much as the slope matters. With a regular raised bed, you want, you want your bed so that the long side is north-south so that as the sun comes around, all of the plants get sun. If you put the bed east-west, then the sun is only gonna shine on one side and make the other ones shaded. Does that make sense? It's also going to depend on any other structures that you have. So for example, I have um, a garden near a wall. So now it almost doesn't matter because that wall is going to provide shade and I'm, certain I'm not going to move it. Okay? All right, they still seem to be a little confused. confused? Um, let me see. I'm trying to think of my own. I think they might have said that back. If it's north, south, I'm looking out my window. My beds are here. I did not put them in. And my son, I have south to east exposure. And so this side gets a lot of sun. Um, if the beds were arranged this way, they would probably get more sun as long as I didn't plant tall things in the front. I think an easier way of thinking about it is to look at your shadows. And you don't want to put plants where they're going to be casting their shadow backwards onto another plant. So whether you're going east, west, or north, south, go outside first and stand there at different times of day and see where your shadow goes. And then put your tall plants in the back end so that their shadows are not falling on everything else. Is that easier to think of it that way? All right. Um, they said, if you say north to south, which way does the long side face? Mm, the issue is face. The, the short end, short end facing east-west so that the long side 
is on the north south north. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm not spatially oriented. Yeah, that's <laughs> one of those things. Um, somebody said, "Isn't downspout water bad for gardens because of the asphalt and chemicals from the roof?" I guess it depends on your roof, but um, no. Um, there are. Uh, this is how rain barrels work. If uh, you install a rain barrel and your downspouts, you're collecting that water for use in your garden or for washing your car. Uh, you're certainly not going to drink it, uh, but it is it is fine to use outside. Um, any suggestions on how to kill a stubborn trumpet vine? Ooh. <laughs> Um, I personally like trumpet vines, so um, I'm not killing mine. Uh, the problem with some of these, whether it's a native or an invasive, is that their root system is really deep. So unless you're willing to really, really dig it out uh, and, and get it all up, um, I will not advocate the use of chemicals. Um, we have a small pond in the back. We live on a brook and um, we don't use any chemicals on our property. Uh, in which case we would be doing a lot of digging um, or perhaps train it, send it to a certain area where you think it's okay for it to go. Um, but that's, that's a tough one. It's a question we've had before. They said they're trying rock salt right now. <laughs> um, the problem is that once the salt gets into your soil, unless it's going to be flushed out uh, over time, you've now con you're contaminating that particular area and only a salt loving plant will ever be able to live there. Now you've introduced something to the environment that um, kills not just what you're trying to kill, but it's going to kill everything else too. That's, that's the problem with um, trying to deal with, with invasives and plants that you may not want somewhere. Uh, now the, the trumpet vines are great for pollinators and great for hummingbirds. Um, so unless it's creating a really bad problem, crawling up a building or something, um, I'm going to love it. I don't know. Um, you mentioned this before, but a couple of people have, have asked, um, you know, would those large aluminum beds get too hot? You know, that was my thought. And if they were small, yes, because I tried it. I, try, I have a, a small decorative, um, looks like a watering can, uh, but it's little. It's, a, it's about this big. And I said, oh, this is cute. I'll put a plant in it. You know, aluminum isn't a problem. Well, when it's that small, it is. It was a really serious heat problem. And I ended up having to try to shade the container without shading the plant that was trying to grow out of it. With those enormous containers, you have so much soil inside compared to the surface area um, that they don't get quite as hot. But I would still be careful with them. They may also mean that you have to add a little bit more water because if it's a little bit warmer, then your plant is using um, more, needs more moisture. But the small ones, definitely, absolutely not. But the really, really big ones seem to work fine. Uh, somebody came in a little bit late and said, uh, can you use elastic pl large plastic containers? Sure. Yeah, they have some advantages. Um, make sure that they have drains in them because the plastic doesn't breathe. Uh, I like clay pots because they tend to breathe. The problem with them is they require even more water uh, than, say, a ceramic pot. The plastic ones are okay, but you do have to let them drain. What is an easy way to determine how much sun your garden patch gets? You measure it. I mean, to like watch it and say, okay, the sun has hit that spot now. Note what time it is and keep an eye on it and, and say, oh, you know, it's six hours. There's still sun in that spot. You just, you just watch it. Typically, your south and east exposures are going to get a lot more sun. Um, I would not bother planting. Uh, at the north side of your property, uh, unless unless it's wide open around it. My neighbor has put his garden on the north side of his house. He complains to me constantly. 
uh, about problems he's having, but he doesn't want to move it to the south side of his house. I don't know why. Typically, get your compass coordinates first, figure out where south and east are, because that's going to be your best exposure. And then just watch the area and time it out. And of course, the amount of sun is also going to differ by season. Uh, so how much sun you're going to get in a particular spot in the spring, summer, or fall is going to be different depending on the sun's position and what might be in the way. So the best is just sit outside or peek outside every once in a while and just make note of it. Um, for vegetable gardens, must the topsoil and potting soil be organic for taste purposes? I would advise that the whole thing, the whole container, um, have organic material in it. Um, we do not advocate the use of any of those. I don't really want to name names, but you think of the biggies uh, in the potting soil uh, gardening world. Um, we don't advocate the use of any of those materials, especially the ones that claim to have um, organic fertilizer in them or any kind of fertilizer in them. Uh, what they tend to do is um, spur the plant to grow really fast, really big, really fast. And you're thinking, oh, wow, you know, this is great. It's working. But it, the plants, like, burn out. Um, they, they, they shoot up and they're exhausted and they can't keep going. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not, um, we don't advise it. We advise that you get, like, the pro mix or that you create your own by mixing uh, topsoil and peat moss and vermiculite uh, and fill your own pots uh, and then add compost as needed. And then I use uh, shredded bark for mulch at the top just to help uh, retain water. And it also helps when I'm watering, if the water hits the mulch, it doesn't tend to, um, if it make holes in the, in the soil, that the, the mulch kind of acts as a buffer and spreads the water more evenly. Um, but I would not, I wouldn't use, um, you know, widely available commercial bagged soil. What are the veggie plants that can grow in partial sun as well as flowers? Off the top of my head, I don't, I don't have a vegetable garden. Um, most of them want full sun, your peppers, your tomatoes, uh, your corns. What do I have growing? I tried red noodle bean in part sun and they did eh. Um, I tried some string beans in part sun, they did okay. Uh, when it comes to herbs and vegetables, you're usually looking at full sun. There might be some varieties or cultivars that will do better with less. Um, the plants that like it cool will do better with less. So for example, your lettuce doesn't have to be in direct sun, uh, but these are some that you can easily uh, look up. Or um, when you buy plants, they have those little tags in them you can take them seriously. Most of them are, are well done, not all, but most of them are well done. Uh, and you can look and if it says um, sun, part sun, then you're okay. You can put it in part sun. As a follow up, where can I get the red noodle beans? <laughs> um, I stole mine. Now, the, I first encountered these at, um, uh, at the Rutgers uh, Gardens at Davidson uh, Mill Pond Park. And um, then I realized that you could order them online. I got mine from a seed company called Johnny's Seeds. Um, a lot of seed companies will, will carry them. And what's interesting is you just have to buy them the one time. Uh, if you, you pick your red noodle beans to eat, but leave a couple and they'll get longer and longer. I, mean, I had one that was almost two feet long. And you can see them getting fat, really fat. And those are the, the beans inside. And then I saved a couple of those and I laid them out to dry. I let them get really, really dry. And then I put them away in a cool, dark place. And then the following year, I just opened up the pods and took out the beans 
and I planted more. So you buy them the one time, it's just a few dollars for a packet that has a large number of seeds in it. And I still have some from the original package, um, but I said, well, let me, just in case, let me see if it will actually work if I can use the ones that I grew and sure enough, it, it does work. But remember the in order for that to happen, your plant has to be outside where the insects are going to be able to do the pollination for you so that you get those fruits and you get those seeds. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, aloe vera does not like sun, right? Even I they are acting like they do not like the outdoors. <laughs> aloe vera is not, um, that is a house plant. Uh, I have one. I have it in uh, a sunny spot, but it's indirect sun. It's doing well. Uh, it tends to be a more, um, it's a tropical plant. And you have to be careful not to give it too much water because the more water you give it, the bigger it'll get and they can become monstrously large. Um, but it will not do well in shade. Most plants, I have huge sections of my property that are very, very shady. And I've been very deliberate in what I can and cannot grow there because there's, uh, there are plants that like to grow in the shade. Um, they're just not what most people want to be planting. So in the shade, I have, um, I have hostas, I have primroses, um, I have rhododendron. Uh, there's a version of a, azaleas that like the shade. Um, what else have I got out there? I'm trying to look out my window and see. Mostly I collect hostas. There's some, um, oh, what's the plant I have in the front? Oh, the name is escaping me right now, but that does, there are several that do well in the shade. Oh, now it's gonna bother me. What's the name of that plant I have in the front? Hmm. Hellebores, also called Lenten Rose, do well in the shade. And they're flowering now. I mine are already flowering. Um, I'll think of the other two. They'll come to me in a minute. How do you prevent weeds in the plants? It's the, it's the bane of every gardener's existence. Um, my back hurts just hearing the word weed. Uh, the best that you can do um, is stop them before they start. I do a lot of picking by hand and I try and do it very carefully. So when I'm pulling a plant out, I'm pulling its root out with it. Um, keep the area clean. And then once you've weeded it, uh, every other year I put down newspaper and then add mulch over it. In the in between year, uh, I may add a little mulch if I need it, but otherwise um, I, I pull them by hand. Um, the effect that I'm going for, and it's going to take me several years to get there, is like what I mentioned with the, the Native Americans and the Three Sisters, that the squash, the large leaves cast shade on the ground and stop the weeds from growing. When you grow your plants close, to, not close together so they're on top of each other, but if this plant needs a foot and this one needs two feet, and this one needs three, but they're grouped together so that their edges all meet. What ends up happening is they're all casting shade down on the ground. And the more shade they cast underneath themselves, then you don't have weeds. So I have one section in my garden that's done and I don't have to weed it because the plants themselves are large enough and have grown together enough. In the other areas where I'm still trying to establish that effect, um, I have weeded by hand and then put down a thick layer of mulch while I'm waiting for the plants um, to grow larger and to grow together. But again, I don't use chemicals. So um, I, I advise other people not to, but other people certainly have that option if they so choose. If um, I'm in a desperate situation, which I usually am with my pavers, we have um, brick and paver pathways. And unfortunately, the, the weeds get into the cracks, the grout in between all the papers and pavers, and it makes me crazy. And I get the big uh, double gallon jugs of vinegar at um, uh, Costco or gallon jugs at uh, ShopRite. And I bought a very inexpensive uh, sprayer, paint sprayer uh, at Home Depot. 
and I put the vinegar in the paint sprayer, then you pump it up to get pressure and it has a little spray nozzle. And that way I can be very deliberate in directing the spray of the vinegar just on the weeds and just in the grout. Um, and that has the advantage that the vinegar uh, will kill the plant uh, and then it will decompose and it does not harm the environment. So I, I go through a lot of vinegar in the spring. Uh, if your house faces north, so your front door and porch and garden are all pretty shaded all the time, can you still plant things there so the front of your house looks loved? Um, yes, you can. You just have to find shade loving plants. Now, my house, uh, my front door faces east, west, sorry, and uh, north, south, but the entire front. Um, is filled with mature trees. So even though the house is facing the right way, there's so many trees that it's created a lot of shade. And consequently, in the front, I've planted, ah, pulmonaria. I've planted um, pulmonaria, pasta, um, Lenten rose, uh, varieties of hostas. I have one um, hydrangea. Uh, some of the varieties of hydrangea will do well in a in a part shade shade. Um, I have those out there. I have um, sumac out there, and then some. What's it called? Not begonia, Virginia, um, which I'm experimenting with. The first year it got a disease and did very badly, so I'm I'm still working on it. Um, but there are there are plants and some very good garden centers will actually set the plants outside in sections um, so that you just simply go to the shade loving plant section uh, and that takes a lot of the guesswork out of it. But yes, there's a lot of things that you can grow in the shade, just not typically fruits and vegetables. Uh, when planting in the large aluminum tubs, would you drill holes in the bottom? They seem to come without drainage holes. Yeah, you should. You should. Um, if you're not going to, then you're going to have to be extraordinarily careful um, about how you're watering. Um, you might have to keep um, an open area so that you can you can tell when you look into it. Um, whether there's water pooling at the bottom. Um, you can try filling the bottom with um, other material. Um, some people have used, excuse me, um, piles of twigs uh, to create kind of a space <clears throat> or stones at the bottom um, so that you're elevating the soil so that if you get too much water in there, the water is sitting in the twigs or in those stones. Um, in the case of the stones, you're adding an enormous amount of weight, though, to your container. So your better bet is to simply drill holes in them before you get started. I have a couple of planters that we purchased, really big, huge containers. Uh, and we actually filled them and set them up. And afterwards, it's like, oh, my gosh, we, they don't have holes in the bottom. And we actually had to drill holes in the bottom while they were full. I thought my husband was, was gonna, he was really upset with me because um, we had to lean them on a dolly and lay on the ground. It was, it was a nightmare. So um, drill your holes first and then um, put something over the hole. I found that um, some sort of screen, a little piece of screen so that your soil isn't dropping through until everything's nice and um, uh, you know, sticking together nicely like a good loamy soil. <clears throat> all right, well, that appears to be all of our questions Question. that we have. So I'd like to take this time to thank you, Patricia, for a fantastic program. Thanks we all having. learned all learned very, very, very much about all different things related to the raised bed gardening. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, it was, you make our programming worthwhile and we hope that we can continue to 
uh, provide relevant programming for all of your, your interests. Um, at this time, I'd like to say to everybody to be safe, be well, and hopefully we will see you again soon. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Have a nice day.